Let's build that medical brain. How many times did you guys have a patient and the patient's blood pressure is out of control and you say, hey, we got to get a secondary hypertension workup. But how often do you actually okay. do it? All the ACTH is supposed to spill over there and you will have an elevated ACTH level in the inferior petrosal sinus will imply presence of a pituitary source. But let me ask you this. Is that testing just the inferior petrosal sinus good enough? It's actually not. In order for you to elevate your sensitivity of really capturing a pituitary source, you want to give a drug to stimulate the pituitary gland to produce more ACTH and then you want to sample your inferior petrosal sinus. So what do you want to give to stimulate your pituitary gland? What stimulates ACTH? CRH. So what you do is a CRH stimulation test. You give CRH, stimulate the pituitary gland and after that you sample the inferior petrosal sinus. Now, if this will show an elevated ACTH, you got your answer. Make sense? That's great. So you can do a CRH stimulation test, but is there any other test that you can do? And the answer is yes, there is. You can actually do another stimulation test called a desmopressin stimulation test. Wait a second, what is desmopressin got to do with secretion of ACTH all of a sudden? Does it make any sense, right? Because what is desmopressin? It's vasopressin. Does vasopressin typically stimulate ACTH release from your pituitary gland? It actually doesn't. But interestingly, whenever a patient got Cushing's disease and a Cushing's a tumor in your pituitary gland, do you know there is actual presence of increased AVP receptors on those corticotrophs? The moment the person develops a pituitary adenoma with, which is secreting, hypersecreting ACTH, those cells have receptors for AVP, which is arginine vasopressin, which is desmopressin. So they have increased receptors for AVP. So when you give the patient desmopressin, what is it going to do? It's going to stimulate the AVP receptors and produce a lot of ACTH. And then you will measure it in the inferior petrosal sinus. And if it's elevated, now you got your answer. Make sense? So the moment your MRI is negative, you don't stop there. You don't give up on the pituitary yet. You will do either a CRH stimulation test or a desmopressin stimulation test and measure inferior petrosal sinus for ACTH levels. And if your ACTH is elevated, you got your answer as a pituitary source. Make sense? What if you did that? You went that far and did all those tests and it's still negative. Then what? Can you now say, you know what? I think we've worked up the pituitary good enough. We can move to the lung. Yes, you can. Once you've done all these steps is when you can say, hey, now we can move on to the lung. Okay. Now, what about the high dose dexamethasone suppression test then? What happened to that test? It's been the test that we always spoke about for the God knows how long, right? It is not as sensitive as all these other tests. So therefore, it is not favorable anymore. But say you do CRS stimulation test and desmopressin stimulation test and everything's negative. At this point, maybe you can consider doing a high dose dexamethasone suppression test here to differentiate between pituitary versus a lung source because the idea is how much dexamethasone do you give when it's high dose because low dose was one what is high dose eight you give eight milligrams at night and normally what should happen is high dose dexamethasone should suppress your pituitary but not your lung right so if it suppresses it's pituitary if it doesn't suppress its lung but there's more data now saying that it can still suppress the lung too that is why it is kind of going out of favor so right now high dose dexamethasone suppression test is really going out of favor okay but if you still want to do that test it comes at this point okay but you did that these tests and you're like okay you know what we've completely drained out the pituitary there is no increased production from ACTH from the pituitary gland we've done it right at that point, once that's negative, what's your next step? Now you want to look for the lung. So what do you do? You can do a CT scan of your lung. You do a CT scan of your lung and see, is there a tumor? If there is a tumor, that gives you the answer. But what if your CT is negative? Because always you look for something, but you never find it, right? That's the beauty of medicine. 
So what is the next step? There's always a next step. What are you going to do? When you cannot see a cancer cell, do you have some different scans you can do? You can do something known as a PET scan to see uptake by different cells, right? Or you can do octreotide scan because the lung cancer that produces ACTH is a small cell lung cancer and a small cell lung cancer is a neuroendocrine tumor. Octreotide being a somatostatin analog will have an uptake in your neuroendocrine tumor and therefore it will be positive. So if your regular CT scan is negative, you will go for PET scan or an octreotide scan. Yes? And that's your complete workup to figure out if the patient's got Cushing syndrome. Right? Now the question is, how do you treat it? You're not treating hypertension, you're treating the problem. Remove the problem and get rid of it, right? So if it was an adrenal source, what's your treatment? Get it out, right? If it's an adenoma, do surgery, get it out, right? So most of the time, if somebody's got Cushing syndrome because of an adrenal gland, you will remove it. The moment you remove it, do you need to give this patient something? So you want to remove the problem and then you want to become the problem by giving the patient the steroid. Why? You just like to be the problem. <laughs> Why do you do it? Because you're saying the patient's got too much steroid and you see the adrenal tumor, you're like, this is the one that's producing too much, so let me remove it. I removed it out. And then you want to put the patient on steroid to make the problem happen again. Why? You're right. Because imagine if this adrenal tumor, if this adrenal gland is producing way too much of cortisol, is that giving negative feedback to your ACTH? Yes, which means your ACTH will be very low for a long time. If the ACTH has been very low for such a long time, was this adrenal gland ever stimulated? It wasn't. And therefore, this adrenal gland has been atrophied and not producing any cortisol. Now, you had one hyperfunctioning, but ACTH not being produced, and this adrenal gland not producing any cortisol. So once you remove it, what do you do? You've completely deprived this patient of cortisol. And can you live without cortisol? No, you can't. So immediately, the patient will go into adrenal insufficiency. So the moment you remove your adrenal tumor, you must put the patient on cortisol, okay? You have to put them on some form of steroid until the axis takes over and this adrenal gland recovers. So adrenal gland, we know how to treat if the problem is there. What if it's a lung tumor? That's also pretty easy. If it's a stage one cancer, you can remove as surgery. But if uh, the cancer is spread, you treat as cancer. A bigger problem becomes Cushing's disease. Okay, that's why the pituitary gland being the problem is so important. If you've diagnosed the patient with Cushing's disease, meaning there's a pituitary adenoma, either it's visualized or you did your test and proved that elevated ACTH and the inferior petrosal sinus sampling. Either way, it's Cushing's disease. How do you treat it? Is it medical or is it surgical? Medical. It is surgical. Your first line is going to be transphenoidal resection. Okay? Transphenoidal resection and surgery is your treatment for a pituitary adenoma, for Cushing's disease. Now say you remove the tumor, the patient should improve. Most of the time it's very uh, responsive, 70 to 80 percent remission rates. Okay? They will improve. But sometimes you remove it, but the patient still continues to have Cushing's. Maybe you didn't get it all because you didn't effectively remove all of it. If you can't even see all of it, how do you remove all of it? So there are instances when you're Cushing's disease patient where you have done surgery, but it's not resolving. It is still producing more cortisol. What are you going to do then? Medical. You can do medical treatment, but Sometimes you can also do bilateral adrenalectomy. But again, that seems like a very dangerous thing to do. But apart from that, you can also do medical management. What is the medical management you can do? What drugs can you give to treat a patient with Cushing's disease to suppress it? Do you have some drugs? Yes, yes. what drugs can you do? for medical management. So when is medical management indicated on the context of Cushing's disease? First is always surgery. But for some reason the patient is a terrible surgical candidate, you do medical therapy. Or say somebody had surgery done, but the patient is not improving. 
patient is having more symptoms. Then you will go for medical management. So when it comes to medical management, you can either block off your ACTH release from the pituitary gland by doing drugs such as passireotide, which sounds like octreotide, which is a somatostatin analog. Or you can use drugs such as cabergolin, which is a dopaminergic agonist. Both of these drugs principle is to suppress secretion of ACTH from your pituitary gland. Or, yes the ACTH is being secreted from pituitary gland but the real problem is not ACTH, it's adrenal gland. The ultimate thing to be secreted out is cortisol. So again, you know it's a steroid, so can you block steroidogenesis in the adrenal gland, would that help? So if you block the synthesis of the steroids in the adrenal gland, that is medical therapy. So what drug would you use to do that? The drug that you're going to use to block the steroidogenesis is drugs such as ketoconazole. Then you have levoketoconazole. I mean, this is a very common drug that we all know about, ketoconazole, okay? Then you also have metirapone. Metirapone, and lastly, you have a new drug which is called Ocelodrastat. And these are the four drugs that you can use to block off synthesis of steroids from the adrenal glands and basically block its production. So when you think of medical management, because nobody speaks about this part, and I think it's very important because if your surgery doesn't fix the problem, you can remove both the adrenal glands, but imagine how much of a problem that's going to be. So you don't want to jump to removing everything. You can try medical management as a supportive care or as a preparation to do bilateral adrenalectomy. Because at the end of the day, if your pituitary adenoma is not resolving despite surgical resection and medical management, sometimes what happens is you have no other choice but to remove both adrenal glands. And this is known as bilateral adrenalectomy. What is your biggest worry when you do that? Well, you are inducing Addison's, right? So the moment you remove both those adrenal glands, you will have to put the patient on lifelong steroids. That's number one. But imagine that pituitary adenoma in the brain, right? Say you removed only partially because you removed it, but it was still producing. You tried medical, it's still producing. So there's something in the pituitary that's still active. But you went and removed both the adrenal gland. What have you now done? You have taken away the negative feedback to that tumor. So the moment you remove both, negative feedback's gone. This thing is going to grow back really big and cause increased intracranial pressure and a recurrence of the Cushing's disease. And this is going to cause a major problem. And that problem is going to be called... Nelson syndrome. It is called Nelson syndrome. So the moment you do bilateral adrenalectomy on the context of Cushing's disease, you worry about development of Nelson syndrome. When it comes to secondary hypertension, another important cause you'll always have to think about is going to be hyperaldosteronism. Now, when do you suspect when do you suspect hyperaldosteronism? Um, what kind of patient should you suspect? Is somebody hypertensive? You say, hey, let's work up hyperaldo? No. 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 There has to be something more, right? Again, first off, the patient is going to have resistant hypertension like we already defined it. But what is going to be unique to hyperaldosteronism? What does aldosterone do? Yes, yeah, so aldosterone typically comes from your adrenal gland, right? And aldosterone's job is what? To reabsorb sodium and water and it pushes out H plus and potassium. So it will cause hypokalemia and it's going to cause a metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so the presence of hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis 
is going to be your clue. But is that clue going to be there all the time? No. May not, right? So even with the slightest suspicion, because hyperaldosteronism, like I said, it is one of the most common causes now. If your age is below 40 for resistant hypertension, hyperaldo is a very important cause, okay? So when it comes to hyperaldosteronism, you suspect it. How are you going to test for it? Every view builds your brain. Locked in yet? Watch it again.